Okay, so be quiet, pay attention. Remember we talked about this. So this, guys, so this morning is our third lecture in the 2021 Spring Semester for Environmental Friday Guest Lecture Series. It's part of the Berrien Risa Grade 10 Chemistry course. Uh, it's sponsored by, guys, It's sponsored by the Berrien Risa Math Science Center, Andrews University Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and also by the State of Michigan Office of Clean Water Public Advocate. This morning, our topic is going to be indoor pollution, indoor air quality. And our speakers are Mary Reynolds and Heidi Lassane. Mary works at the, they both work at the Environmental Protection Agency, Region 4, and office, which is in Atlanta. And uh, there, Mary Reynolds is a physical scientist and ra radon coordinator in the communities and air toxic section in the air and radiation division, while Heidi, is a life scientist. Okay, I keep skipping on this. She's a life scientist. And she is uh, the asthma program coordinator for the southwestern, southeastern states of Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina. That's a lot, Heidi, uh, and Tennessee. Uh, so they are well qualified to talk to us both about indoor air quality. The floor, the time is yours. Awesome, thanks so much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So we're, today we're going to talk about indoor air quality. Um, and it's really important because we spend approximately 90% of our time indoors. Um, with the current pandemic, we've spent even more time inside um, and so we are exposed to more indoor air pollutants. The sensitive population, so people that are very young, babies, you know, older adults, people with cardiovascular or respiratory diseases, um, those that are disabled, they spend even more time inside. Um, and this is a problem because indoor air pollutants are two to five times higher than outdoor concentrations. Um, and the indoor concentrations have increased in the last few decades. And that's because we're, um, building more energy efficient buildings and those buildings tend to lack mechanical ventilation to ensure adequate air exchange and that's just a fancy way of saying they're not bringing in a fresh out um, enough fresh outside air um, to help dilute those concentrations um, and so concentrations of pollutants have just been able to build up over time um, we've also increased our use of synthetic building materials and furnishings um, as well as using personal care products, pesticides, and other household cleaners. And again, using all of that stuff um, helps build up indoor concentrations of pollutants. Um, and the indoor air quality um, varies from place to place. Um, it's dependent on numerous factors, such as the air exchange rate, um, the outdoor climate, the current weather conditions, occupant behavior, and uh, numerous other factors. Um, so this is a question for you guys all in the audience. What are some common indoor air pollutants? Can you name them? Okay, so you guys know any indoor air pollutants? What are some? Carbon dioxide, someone said dust. Carbon monoxide. Okay. Those are some responses. <laughs> All right, so there are hundreds um, of indoor air pollutants, um, and that is tobacco smoke, radon, which we'll talk about a little bit today, um, household cleaners, the nitrous dioxide, carbon monoxide, so congrats for that one, you got it, formaldehyde, asbestos, mold, cockroaches, and other pests, um, pesticide use to kill those pests. Um, pets are a really big one, and that's all sorts of pets. Um, you have paint, uh, which release VOCs or volatile organic compounds, pollen, um, particulate matter from smoke, dust again, and lead-based paint. Um, you know, there's hundreds of indoor air pollutants, um, and this is just a comprehensive list. 
Um, so here, since you guys are in a school building, we're going to play a short video of indoor air quality and the importance of ventilation in schools. Children spend a large portion of their day indoors at school. Ensuring that schools are ventilated and have good indoor air quality is critical to protecting and supporting the health and well being of students and teachers. Ventilation means providing fresh outdoor air into classrooms. Ventilation removes indoor air pollutants from buildings by bringing in outside air and exhausting room air, which dilutes the concentration of indoor pollutants. Indoor pollutants include volatile organic compounds that can off-gas from building materials, finishes, furniture, and cleaning products. Indoor pollutants also include respiratory aerosols that are exhaled by building occupants. Reducing the concentration of respiratory aerosols inside buildings is important to reduce the spread of airborne infectious disease, including COVID-19. <clears throat> Ventilation also reduces the indoor concentration of carbon dioxide, or CO2, that is exhaled by students and teachers. Generally, CO2 is not considered an indoor pollutant. However, some research suggests as the concentration of CO2 builds indoors, it can affect the cognitive performance of students. Ventilation is important for all building types but it is particularly important in schools because of the high density of students in an enclosed space. Indoor air quality impacts student health and learning. Research has found that increased ventilation rates are associated with increased student performance, improved respiratory health, increased student attendance, and lower risk of transmission of airborne infectious diseases. How are classrooms ventilated? Classrooms are ventilated either naturally through open doors and windows or mechanically with an HVAC system. Natural ventilation may not provide sufficient airflow for a classroom environment. In addition, the air is not filtered or conditioned and open doors and windows may pose a safety concern. This is why mechanical ventilation is recommended for classrooms. We usually think of HVAC systems for their heating and cooling functions but they also provide ventilation and filtration. How do you know if a classroom is getting enough ventilation? You may think that teachers can detect a problem, but most cannot. In a recent study where teacher surveys were compared to ventilation rates, over 60% of teachers in underventilated classrooms reported that their satisfaction with their indoor air quality was neutral or satisfied. In order to know if a classroom is well ventilated, the HVAC system's ventilation rate must be measured and, if necessary, adjusted to meet the classroom requirement. This should be done by trained, qualified, and certified personnel. The fan supplying the ventilation to the classroom must run at least one hour before scheduled occupancy and during all occupied hours. In addition to testing and adjusting ventilation rates periodically, Continuous monitoring of classroom CO2 levels is recommended to quickly detect ventilation problems. Monitoring CO2 levels is a useful and convenient way to monitor ventilation. You can see here how CO2 concentrations change throughout the day in a classroom. When the classroom is empty at the beginning of the day, CO2 levels are about 400 parts per million, or PPM, which is the outdoor air concentration of CO2. When students come in, the level of CO2 will rise. In a well-ventilated classroom, it'll level off below 1,100 ppm. In a classroom with ventilation problems, it'll keep climbing, sometimes as high as 3,000 ppm. Research from around the world shows there are high CO2 levels in many classrooms. For example, in a 2019 study, Researchers found that about 85% of 94 recently installed HVAC systems in California K-12 classrooms did not provide adequate ventilation. We recommend that school districts take the following actions to improve classroom ventilation and indoor air quality. When purchasing new HVAC equipment, 
Select equipment capable of providing sufficient ventilation rates for high occupancy areas like classrooms. When installing new HVAC equipment, test and adjust the system to provide the required ventilation rate. Periodically, test existing HVAC equipment to ensure the required ventilation is provided. With minor adjustments, many existing systems will be able to meet ventilation requirements. Hire contractors and technicians that are certified by a testing, adjusting, and balancing certification agency. Ensure that building control systems and thermostats are programmed to operate ventilation fans one hour before school starts and continuously during the school day. Inform teachers on the importance of operating ventilation fans continuously. Install sensors in classrooms to continuously monitor CO2 levels and detect potential ventilation problems. Thermostats with integrated CO2 sensors and standalone sensors are widely available. When possible, use filters with a minimum efficiency rating value or MERV of 13 or greater to remove small particles from the air. Change filters every three to four months during the school year so that airflow is sufficiently maintained. Ensuring adequate ventilation rates in classrooms is essential and will help support the health and productivity of students and teachers. Um, so that was just a little thing for indoor air quality in schools and how you can improve them in schools. Um, and the CO2 monitors is kind of general for all indoor air pollutants uh, with that increased ventilation. Oops, we're not gonna watch that again. Um, so there's just something to compare um, between the HVAC system and the respiratory system. Um, so the air intake through the HVAC system goes into the mixing chamber. So that just means the in, um, air that's already in the room combined with the fresh outdoor air with the fan that then is filtered out um, here. And then it's the air you breathe and then it escapes through that way. And it's very similar to our respiratory system. We breathe in through our nose. Um, our nose hairs is actually the filter that filters out any sort of pollutants. Anything that remains comes through um, into our lungs where they are tried um, further either um, filtered out through the lungs and breathed back out or um, it's absorbed into the bloodstream um, where those pollutants are then carried through um, through the arteries and to other organs such as the heart, the stomach, the liver and such um, to then cause damage that way. Um, so with that, with the health effects, we have either short-term or long-term health effects and short-term health effects from indoor air pollutants. Um, you know, they show up shortly after exposure, um, whether that's a single exposure or repeated exposures to that pollutant. Um, and the health effects are similar to a cold, um, you know, eye irritation, nose, throat um, irritations, headache, dizziness, and fatigue, you know, similar to any seasonal allergies you've seen anyone um, get. Um, and these um, short-term effects are usually treatable um, either by eliminating the person's exposure to a pollutant um, or you know, some sort of um, action to combat that trigger. Um, and with that, um, you know, people are affected differently. So it's gonna uh, depend on your age or pre-existing medical conditions, um, your sensitivity to that exposure or that pollutant um, and even previous exposure and more. Um, and some exposure um, to some indoor air pollutants can aggravate or worsen some symptoms of disease, such as asthma, which we'll get to in just a second. Um, and then we have long-term effects that, um, you know, show up only after uh, long-term exposure um, over long periods of time. Um, and these are some respiratory diseases, heart diseases, cancer, um, or other things that can be fatal. Um, and that includes, you know, lead-based paint, um, you know, you eat the lead. Um, when you're a child, and that can have some brain development to radon, which causes lung cancer. Um, and pollutants are found everywhere, and they're very common inside, but the health effects, um, there are considerable uncertainty about the exposure, what sort of health effects are caused, um, so that's just a caveat that further research is needed. Um, so I'll take it over to Heidi to talk about asthma and those indoor air pollutants. Good morning. So let's talk about asthma right quick. Um, as Mary mentioned, exposure to air pollutants can cause effects such as health effects such as asthma. 
Um, asthma is a serious, sometimes life-threatening, chronic respiratory disease. Um, if you look at that first model, and I, and I don't hear any coughing in the background, so I assume everybody has a normal airway right now. Um, when one has an asthma attack, their um, airway, airways are, they narrow and they swell at the same time, and they also fill with mucus. Some symptoms of asthma are wheezing and coughing and shortness of breath. Um, raise your hand if you have asthma. You got some hands up there? Uh, I don't have any hands. Really? Yes. Impressive. Raise your hand if you know someone with asthma. Do you know someone? Okay. You got some okay. hands up? Okay, yeah, lots of hands. You got to at least it's um, 20 more than 26 million people in America have asthma. So you have to somebody knows somebody that yep. has asthma if they don't have it themselves. Although there's no cure for asthma right now, um, it is controlled through medical treatment and management of environmental triggers. So let's talk about environmental triggers. Here are some of the most common environmental triggers that get folks, especially our kids, landed in the hospital. Now each trigger and the severity of symptoms can differ, differ for each person. So someone can be in, allergic to pollen, um, some people mold set them off, cockroaches, you never know. So it's, it's individual. So now let's, let's discuss a couple of these triggers and how to manage them in the schools and also in your home. Smoking, raise your hand if you smoke. I hope I don't see, you can hope, tell me. If yeah, we, I hope we don't see any hands. Okay, <laughs> okay no hands. <laughs> and um, specifically secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke is the smoke of the air from cigarettes, cigars, or pipes being exhaled from a smoker. So just know this, you do not have to smoke to get lung cancer. Hmm. Someone can smoke around you and you can be exposed to it um, enough to have health effects. So remember that. So you guys are old enough to ask people to not smoke around you or you are old enough to remove yourself from secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke has more than 4,000 chemicals, including cancer causing chemicals. Hmm. Um, secondhand smoke triggers asthma and can increase the severity of asthma attacks. Children receiving high doses of secondhand smoke run the greatest risk of experiencing damaging health effects. And so we at the Environmental Protection Agency are very concerned about environmental tobacco smoke and what it does to our youth. Next slide. Now, e-cigarettes. Who's heard of e-cigarettes? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of them, yeah. I think most of them have, yep. E-cigarettes. Yeah, they, they are, if you don't know, they are the electronic devices that heat a liquid and produce a small a, a mix of small particles in the air. And a lot of these particles, because we can't control how it is heated, are um, harmful chemicals. Um, if you don't know about e-cigarette, we call them vaping. Have you heard of vaping? Vaping, yep. All right. <clears throat> Lots of shaking, yes. shaking heads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These e-cigarettes are vape. When you vape, contain nicotine, which is a highly addictive. It is very addictive, so um, it can harm adolescents' brain development. And you're in school to learn, so we don't want to do that. Defective e-cigarette batteries have caused fires and explosions, which have resulted in injuries. So please. If you know someone vaping, um, hmm. and make sure they don't have it in their pockets all the time because that, hopefully they don't have it at all. But if you know someone, 
make sure they don't have it in their pockets because these devices can explode at any moment mm. and injure and burn people. All right, let's go to another trigger. Pets. I know everybody, not everybody, but most of you may have pets. How many of you have pets? Everybody who raised their hands, they all have pets. Everybody has pets. Okay, so this is a sensitive one. I know this is like, well, well, your class, most of them don't have asthma, so it won't hurt as much. Yeah. But pets are an asthma trigger, can be an mm. asthma trigger for folks. So you have to be careful if you have you have asthma and you have and pets are your asthma trigger. It is the pet dander in this in the skin flakes. And also in the saliva, when they come and kiss on you, that acts as a protein. And um, so you have to be careful because they get into particles, they dry up and get into the air. And some people have severe asthma attacks. Next slide. So if that was you, and it's not you, most of your class, but if you had asthma and the pet was, um, do not sleep with your pet and you would also have to clean your pet periodically more than most people and vacuum 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 to get the pet dander um, out of your area also allergen proof mattress and pillow covers would help out if you were allergic if you were allergic to pets all right, Lo, let's go to one of my favorite asthma triggers, pests. So did you guys know that cockroaches can cause an asthma attack? No, I didn't. Anybody know cockroaches? And a lot of people don't think about that. So how many, hmm. you have a lot of boys in your class? A lot of boys, yep. A lot Most of guys. Well, it could be girls. So my question is, when you see a cockroach, what is the first thing? What do you do when you see a cockroach? They smash, they smash it, they stomp on it. <laughs> and then what is, do you walk away? What do you and do after that? The follow-up question, and then what? What do you guys do? Do you walk away? What do you do when you? She made, she said she makes sure it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and that is the response for most. Um, so, if you have uh, what with the issue with the cockroach um, on their arms, in their um, in their legs, and also in their feces, um, they have this special protein. And so when you step on it, and the air blows, that gets in the air to one that's in, that's allergic to this certain. I allergy. don't think I don't think some of them heard that when you smash it, you said it releases a special protein. Yes, so. Yeah, it releases a protein on because they have this certain protein on their arms and their legs and also in their feces. So if you stepped on it and you didn't clean it up, and I know if you're outside, fine, but if you're in the house, if you happen to be in your house and you don't immediately clean it up, um, that will get in the air. And some people, someone that is allergic to this certain protein could have a severe asthma attack because mm. dried cockroach pieces are in the air. Mm. Something to think Ooh, about. Huh? That's, yeah. Let's go to the <laughs> next slide. Yes. Um, well, same for the mouse um, and the rats, it's, but the mouse and the rats, their issue is usually the, the urine and, um, and it gets in the air and, um, and Rats and mouse, they, their um, urine can get in the air for hours. Mm. So hopefully that is not your trigger because it um, it may not be detectable. And they're, um, they like to hide. So you may not even know it happened or it's in the area. And you're wondering why when I walk in this area, I start coughing and wheezing. It mm. could be the dried urine so wow. so let's talk about actions to take first of all and this is but every time you eat you should immediately clean up do you know cockroaches you may not be able to see them but they see you and they see you <laughs> eat 
and they are um they are waiting for you to walk away they hope you don't clean up so they can get crumbs and eat off of you so make sure you always help your parents and if when you move on to your own place when you you uh, when you go to college make sure you clean up after yourself there are always co- there could be cockroaches um and rats in hiding in the way waiting to eat your food hmm. um another thing is um we at the environmental protection agency we use something called integrated pest management so we hope if you ever had a pest problem that you would try a natural way to get rid of them before you start using toxic sprays. Mm. So maybe um, if you had an issue, try traps and baits naturally first. Now, you know, if it's a terrible problem and you need a help, of course, get professional help. But we try to do natural ways before you try to use the sprays. We, we don't like the sprays. All right, let's go to another one. Mold. mold. What do you guys know about mold? Anybody seen mold mold lately? Seen mold lately? Yes. Few hands up. Yep. Yep. Yes. Hands and shaking heads. Yep. All right. <laughs> mold. <laughs> mold. And I ask that because mold is found almost everywhere. It can be detected indoors, outdoors, and year round. Mold growth thrives in warm and humid conditions. So um, I know it's been cold right now, but mold can be done everywhere. Here are a few. Um, next slide. Here are a few common locations for mold growth. So if you haven't seen it, maybe you saw it this morning in the bathroom, sink, um, in your showers in the corner, they like to hide and grow in areas um, if you have basements, some of the walls, windows. Um, so mold can be everywhere. Next slide. Actions to take. If you see any issues, um, try to fix any moisture problems as soon as, prob- um, as, soon as possible. Watch out for condensation and uh, wet spots. Use an exhaust fan when you're showering. Um, if you don't, maybe you can crack a window, um, clean up any dry, wet, damp spots um, within 48 hours. Within 48 hours, that's when the melt mold begins to grow. So if you can do that. All right. So why do we worry about this? Let's just take a look at your classroom. There are many opportunities for asthma trigger to, um, to reside. Next slide. So this is a cluttered classroom and I know your classroom does not look like that. I am just looking at your teacher, but I know if he flipped that screen, that does not look like the classroom, correct? Uh, Correct. (laughs) But cluttered cluttered classrooms make it harder to clean and they provide a nice home for insects, rodents, and pests. Think about it. Your custodian usually only have 10 minutes to tackle each classroom and so clutter means that they can't do their job effectively. So keeping a clean room is, is critical to your safety and your health. Next slide. Um, so we didn't talk about this asthma trigger, but dust mites are the common asthma trigger. That's funny. Dust mites, you know, um, you can only see dust mites under the microscope, but they eat our skin flakes. So, um, They love to hang out on those plush toys, those pillows, those rugs, and those blankets. So if you had something in that classroom, who's cleaning it up? Is anybody taking that home to wash it? Dust mites die in very, very high heat and very, very cold weather. So if you had this in your classroom, it would have to be properly clean. Next slide. And here's some more classroom issues. I know we're not worried about in your classroom. Next slide. And um, we have to be careful about burning candles and those scents. Why would we have to be careful? Anybody think about that? Um, 
why we should not use plugins in the classroom? Hmm. Anybody? Like those scented plugins? Scented plugins, candles. Why would we not use that in the in the general classroom? The allergies to the any, any idea? And oils. Very good. I hear somebody on on speaking. What, what's your in, answer? Well. Could be allergic, asthma attack. Okay. That's right. Could be allergic. You never know who is chemically sensitive to what. So you cannot burn that because even though I know teachers say, well, when they come back from gym, I just want the room to smell okay. So I spray. <laughs> you can't do that. Somebody can have a severe asthma attack or a chem chemically sensitive and, and just be irritated. So you have to think about everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And here's my last slide. Watch what you put under the chemi chemicals, which you put under the sink. Make right. sure you know what they are and um, what you put side by side. This is a chemistry class, correct? That's correct. That's you correct. Would not put bleach next to ammonia and everything lined up together. You don't know what type of, um, you could be creating a little bomb under the sink. So make mm -hmm. sure you do. And the fumes will get out, and especially if you're in a classroom or in a science room and irritate someone. So that is my time. I'm gonna take it back to Mary and she's gonna talk about radon. Yeah, so next up, we're going to talk about radon um, as a chemistry class. Radon is a noble glass. Um, it's a silent but very manageable killer. Um, so what is radon? It's a radioactive, colorless, odorless, and tasteless gas. It's invisible. You can't see it. It's part of the uranium-238 decay chain. Um, it's naturally found throughout the Earth um, as uranium breaks down, um, and it's the second leading cause of lung cancer. As a chemistry class, does anyone know the atomic number of radon? There's a noble gas. I gave that atomic answer. number of radon. Looking at the table, eighty-six. Good job. That's <laughs> um, so, as a chemistry class, I just wanted to show you the breakdown of uranium into um, radon. So, up in the top corner, you have uranium thirty-eight breaks down into thorium, which goes then back to uranium two thirty-four. Again, back to your um, thorium to radium down to radon. Um, and this radon here with all of this big um, chunk at the bottom, those are the radon decay products. And that is where the cancer causing comes from, which we'll go into in a little bit. Um, um, so why is radon a health concern? Um, so as you inhale those radon decay products that I just showed you, um, you breathe that in and then those alpha particles then uh, come in and destroy um, your DNA material. So it's radiation damage. Can I stop you? Can I stop you? What's an alpha particle? We learned this last semester. What's an alpha particle? It's a helium two plus. All right, very good. That's really highly positive. That's dangerous. Yes, it is okay. very dangerous. Um, right. Radon is class A carcinogen, which is the same level as tobacco smoke. Um, so breathing in the radon level um, increases your risk of lung cancer, and it's the leading cause of lung cancer among non-smokers um, and second leading cause of lung cancer behind cigarette smoking. It's estimated 21 deaths per year um, is caused by radon breathing in these alpha particles. Hmm. Um, so your radon risk, just to show you kind of um, relative so it causes 21 deaths per year, which is more than drunk driving. Um, it's also more than falls in the home, drownings, and home fires combined. Wow. Uh, as far as your health risk equivalency, um, having a laydown level of two picocuriliters um, is equivalent to four cigarettes per day or 100 chest x-rays per year. EPA has an action level of four picocuriliters, but that's still smoking about eight cigarettes per day. And if you have elevated radon levels, you know, all the way up to 40 picocuriliters, um, that's 80 cigarettes per day. And that's two, mm -hmm. four packs, four packs of cigarettes a day, um, which is equivalent to 2000 chest x-rays per year. Mm. Um, and so is there a safe level of radon? The short answer is no, as you could just see from that chart, even below the EPA action level of four picocuriliters, um, it's still smoking eight cigarettes per day. 
Um, and we kind of have a chart breakdown of anything above four picocuri liters is unsafe um, and it's recommended to mitigate against. Anything between two to four picocuri liters um, is monitor and consider mitigation and anything below two is just monitor. Um, but again, levels below four are not safe. Um, you know, as from the last graph, it's four or eight cigarettes. Um, but you can also do some behavior changes that increases your risk of cancer um, just because of radon. And so if you're a smoker or if you've ever smoked um, at that four pico cure liters, it's 62 per 1000 is your chances to get um, lung cancer and never smokers that drops down to seven per 1000. Um, and in this little graphic in the right, it's 14% of the 300,000 um, lung cancer cases are attributed to radon. So that's 42,000 people per year um, that have lung cancer cases uh, due to radon. And so that's per year. Um, and there's 21,000 deaths per year. So you can kind of see um, it's a pretty big public health risk. Um, so how does it get into your home? Um, as the radon breaks down from uranium and that fractured bread rock there, it escapes through the cracks and stuff, enters the soil or the groundwater, um, and the radon continues to go up into the air. And as it's moving up through the soil, it encounters your home. Um, and so here's a picture of a basement, but it doesn't matter if it's a home with a basement or without a basement, but it enters through the cracks and crevices, any fittings, any cracks between the windows and the walls, um, and enters your home. Um, it can also enter through the groundwater there, and then as you're showering or using your dishwasher, it aerates, um, and then radon gets trapped into your home, similar to how it gets trapped as heat. As the heat stays in your home, um, because it's well insulated, the radon stays as well. So then it builds up to very dangerously high levels. Um, and that's where you get the damage as you breathe in that radon. Um, so how big is the problem? Um, it's estimated one in 15 homes have elevated radon levels, but this is actually a pretty low estimate. This study was done in the 90s. And as we become more energy efficient, um, you know, like I said earlier, more energy efficient buildings lack the ventilation, which increases air pollutant con concentration. So it's similar with radon as we become more efficient building new homes, um, the radon is more likely to get trapped to elevated levels. So that's actually one in 15 is a pretty low estimate. I would say one in 10 homes at this point, mm. uh, which equates to about 6 million existing homes and 60,000 homes per year. Um, and it varies from place to place, but every county um, has shown to have a high radon level problem. And so the only way to know is to test um, for radon levels in your home. You can have your neighbor has something as high as 100 picocuri liters, whereas your other neighbor can have something as 1.25. And that's just really dependent on the structure of the home, what year it was built um, and all of that stuff. And so it's very important to test your home to know the radon levels and radon isn't just stuck in your home it also can be found in schools and other buildings as well um, and so it's very easy to test for your home for radon um, it costs about it's under twenty dollars to get a short-term test and then under 30 usually to get a long-term test and that's if you do it yourself and you can find do-it-yourself test kits. Um, we partner with Kansas State University to provide discounted test kits. Um, how, they're also available at home improvement stores. Um, but if you do purchase at home improvement stores, just note that um, it may not include the lab analysis fee. That could be a little bit extra. Um, but also many state programs offer discounted test kits to their residents. I forgot to check for Michigan, um, but I don't believe they do to my knowledge at this moment. Um, but they're pretty cheap at other places as well. Um, and if you don't feel like you can handle testing it, um, you can hire qualified testers and mitigators. Um, and they're pretty simple devices. They're made of um, activated charcoal, so they absorb the radon, and then you send it off to the test, um, the lab, and that's gonna show your radon average for the time you did that test. So if you did a short-term test, it's two to seven days, it's gonna show your average of the however long you did it, whether it's four days or seven days. And then long-term is three to 12 months. Um, and that's gonna show your average over that time period. Um, 
So you tested your home um, and you have high levels of radon, uh, but do not worry. If your levels are around four picocuri liters, I always recommend to do a second test, you know, just to make sure the accurate levels. Um, however, that's with the caveat, if it's 40 picocuri liters, uh, you have a radon problem. Uh, it's definitely just go ahead straight into mitigation. Um, and mitigation is pretty easy. Um, basically what they do, they have a sub pump um, that creates a depressurization zone within the house. Um, and then you have that fan there, a bunch of PVC pipes that basically draws the radon out similar to like a straw or a vacuum, um, making that house a negative pressure. Um, so the radon doesn't enter the home, but enters the fan instead. Um, so instead of having it come up into your home, it's coming into the fan and out above into the atmosphere where you not are um, and can easily blow away. Um, there you go. So just some radon uh, system components. You have that sealed pump up there, the PVC pipe where the radon travels through, that fan that creating that um, depressurization zone, and then that exhaust pipe up there. Oops, skipped ahead. Um, um, so each home has a unique mitigation system and it can be added to existing homes or if your parents are in the process of building a new home, you can talk to your contractor and say, hey, you should build it with radon resistant new construction. Um, and it's always recommended to use certified mitigators. Um, and this is especially true in that picture in the bottom right corner. You can see that exhaust pipe is right next to a window. So as the wind blows, as the radon is enter leaving the home, the wind blows uh, the radon right back into that open window there. Um, so it's very important to make sure that you're um, having a solid design um, with your mitigation system to make sure you're not then inadvertently breathing in the radon at a later point. Um, so just some general, um, you know, we talked a lot today um, to improve your indoor air quality. So the biggest thing is source control. So eliminate the source of the pollution. So with Heidi's example of the candles, you know, just don't use the candles. Um, and then improve ventilation. So that video we showed you earlier, um, increase the amount of outdoor air through either mechanical or natural means. Um, and that's gonna help dilute the um, concentration as that old saying, the solution to pollution is dilution. Um, and that is the case with the um, indoor air quality. Um, also recommended for severe cases or you know, just general cleaning are air cleaners. Um, and these can be portable air cleaners and they can be high efficiency particulate air or HEPA filters. Um, and that's really great for particle remover uh, to remove particles. They have very tightly woven filters um, that allows for those bigger particles like tobacco smoke, dust, pollen to be removed. Um, you can also use granular activated carbon filters, um, and those are for more gaseous pollutants, um, you know, such as the radon has that activated carbon, but that carbon kind of soaks in those gas pollutants um, and any sort of VOCs like that. And some other things you can do, um, you know, just to have knowledge is test for radon, reduce your asthma triggers, prevent mold by controlling moisture, um, you know, keep your home and car smoke free to prevent any secondhand smoke, um, install carbon monoxide alarms, as well as carbon dioxide um, monitors to know your ventilation rates um, and properly maintain your ventilation system. So making sure you're doing that properly. Um, we are done. So these are just some additional resources if you guys are interested. Um, I know you have to do a project at the end. So we have some asthma um, from the CDC, EPA HUD, smoking um, and secondhand smoke stuff, moisture and mold, how to get rid of mold, um, radon, and then other indoor air quality um, and ventilation stuff as well. And that is the end of our presentation. Heidi, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, thank you so much for having us. And I hope we've helped and we're here to help if you um, have any questions. Yeah, they have to take off, but I have one question for them. How many persons now have found a topic that they might be interested in? Because this presentation had tons, tons, literally tons of topics you could choose from, okay? We will, of course, put it online. Uh, so you guys could go back and review it, but there's a lot of topics possible from this one lecture. Okay, Mary and um, Heidi, they might be getting in touch with you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank okay. You.
Bye. Bye. <laughs> very good. Very good. Have a great weekend, Dr. Murray. And you too. And would you like me to email you the extra credit or would you like me to just bring it into you on in person on a Wednesday? Yeah, we could do that. Um...